What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and this is episode 838 with my guest today, Sensei Chris Hansen. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists, probably people like you. If you love martial arts, then you will probably love the things that we do even beyond this show. So please check out whistlekick.com for all the things that we've got going on. One of the things you'll find over there is an ever-rotating selection of products in our store. And if you use the code of PODCAST15, that's going to save you 15% on the stuff there. Now, if you want to go deeper on this show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Every single episode we've ever done is available for you. We have transcripts and links and photos, all kinds of good stuff to get more context out of these episodes. And if you want to support our mission to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world, there are a few things you can do. The biggest one you can do right now, you could consider supporting our Patreon, what we kind of call our family program. Whistlekick.com, no, patreon.com slash whistlekick starts at just $2 a month. And as your contribution grows, as you are willing to throw us a little more money, we're going to throw you a lot more stuff. There's a lot of great stuff. Go behind the scenes, find out who's coming up on episodes and stuff like that. Other things you can do to help us out. Well, you could share this episode with someone. You could follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick Everywhere. You could buy a book, leave a review. Pretty much anything you could think of would be helpful. If you want to help us out, we certainly do appreciate it. Where's my notes? I don't even know where my notes are. I guess I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> well, today's episode was a great one. I had a really fun time with Chris. And I think that's going to come through. I think you'll see that we both had a really enjoy. Well, maybe I shouldn't speak for him. It seemed like he had a really enjoyable time. I know I did. And we talked for a little bit after and we were just, you know, just somebody who I think is on the same page. I think we're on the, on the same wavelength about martial arts and it was great chatting with him. So, uh, here we go. My conversation with Chris. Hey, Chris, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Hey, I'm, I'm, Looking forward to this, you know, um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this is that the audience doesn't get to see or hear what happens before, right? We, we, we pick a specific, it's like, like this goes. Yeah. And, you know, even in, in the old days when we were using Zoom, we would say, okay, we'll start it here, right? It was very yeah. rare that the first second that I have with someone would get recorded, but I kind of wish we had had that. Right. I, I felt like from second one, we could have just gone, could have. you know, if we had turned off clocks or something, I, I've got a feeling this could be one of those like, oh, have we really been talking for three hours? It just, I get that vibe about you. Yeah, it's going to happen. I think <laughs> we're going to have to say, hey, uh, so I have an appointment so I, and I gotta, yeah, I gotta go. it's going to be one of those. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's because of some people that we know in common. And uh, yeah, you know, shout will. out to Andy Rodriguez. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, for all of this. Uh, yeah. I met him in, uh, like, as we spoke kind of prior, um, in, uh, Philadelphia, um, at, um, Michael, Master Michael Salona's, uh, club, uh, Revolution oh, yeah. Martial Art Institute, uh, yeah. in Philly. Um, it was a great time. And, uh, yeah, eh, Andy's, uh, he's a huggable, lovable, skilled such a great martial guy. artist. <laughs> he's such a great guy. You just, you know, yeah. and you just reminded me of something I got to reach out to him about. Yeah. So I'm just taking a note. There we go. All right. Now I'm all yours. See, this is, this is one of the interesting things about the show. You know, you're mentioning Master Salono. Like, I know, I know him. I've talked oh, to you him. Do. Like I, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, Mike. They're, they're, the martial arts world, it's funny because it's huge, but it's not. Yeah. 200, this is based on the research I've done and putting together numbers because these numbers don't exist in any one place. About 250 million people globally. Wow. Training in something. Yeah. And in the, in the U.S., I don't know what the Canadian numbers are. In the U.S., somewhere 7, 8, 10 million, somewhere in there. Right? That's a lot of people. Yep. But once you get beyond, you know, a couple years of training, it gets really small. It does. And once you get into lineage and you start talking about this one and that one and, you know, where you trained and, you know, your forefathers and stuff. And yeah. Everybody knows each other. It's great. Yeah. I was I was on a road trip 
couple weeks ago and I'm at this gas station and this guy's wearing an Ishin Ru shirt. Nice. And I said, Oh, do you train? And he's like, yeah. So he's like, what about you? And I, I said, well, you know, one of my instructors came out of Ishin Ru out of, you know, this lineage and he was from here. And he's like, Oh, I know him. There you go. I was like, do you really? He's like, yeah, of course. <laughs> Karate t-shirts. It does something for you. There's, there's just, there's something. I have this dream. I've, I've you know, I've got the whistle kick shirt on now. Yeah. One of my dreams yeah. is that I'm going to get an email one day from somebody that says, you know, I was, I was traveling. I was in an airport and I had a whistle kick shirt on and somebody came up to me and they just, and they started the conversation with, what do you train? Yeah. That's, that's one of my dreams. Like skip ahead from the, Oh, do, do you do? No. I'm just going to assume and I'm going to say, oh, what do you trade? And then, you know, I'll get, I'll get tagged in some Instagrams reel that, you know, the two of them may, you know, spar during their layover, you know, in some <laughs> corner of some airport in the middle of nowhere, right? Like that's the stuff I want to see happen. You're, you're kind of on a mission, mission yeah, of or, similar or, spirit. Or I just thought of something like, or, or let's just say you, you have that conversation with the same dude on a plane and he's bored because of the flight and th we're f trying to find a corridor or some little square footage in the plane to do some shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm it's, saying? It's, it's not, you know, it's not, uh, uh, pardon the, the, the bluntness. It's not, you know, mile high club, you know, you're just like, okay, we're, we're not, we're not going in the bathroom. We're not doing that. You know, it's just, let's, let's go in the back of the plane and let's, you know, let's work some elbows and some That's close right. range stuff. Let's do some clinch. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I love but, it. Um, so Philadelphia, meeting people that we know in person, there's a there's an, a part we'll come back to. You're traveling around doing something. That's not something that most people do. What were you in Philadelphia doing? Yeah, what do you so, travel uh, and teach and share? We so in a nutshell, first of all, are we recording just to make sure? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. We're five minutes in. <laughs> no, because I, I, I don't mean that as a disrespect. It's just that I uh, I had Kung Lee. Do you know who Kung Lee is? I know that name. Uh, he's a uh, Asian American, Vietnamese American martial artist. Uh, okay. He, he had a very short uh, UFC UFC okay. uh, bout. That's why uh, I know he was name. a Strike Force champion. Okay. Um, and he had a small uh, acting career too. Uh, he had some films with Donnie Yen and things, mm -hmm. but, uh, anyway, he's a beast. We had, <laughs> this is embarrassing. We had a 20 to 25 minute amazing talk. And then I'm looking and I don't see the red dot and I'm going, Oh, Oh, I dropped a couple of F bombs. I was but, going, Oh, Kung, I'm so sorry, but I didn't record. <laughs> well, there's the and, long, the longest pre-show ever. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was, I mean, he was. He was really comfortable with you by that point. He was good. He was good. He actually, the guy was amazing. He says, okay, let's summarize. Where were we? Let's go back to the beginning. And, you know, yeah. so, but anyway, so we're recording. But yeah, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, so basically, uh, Karate, Karate Unity, just to tell you a little bit about it, and yeah. I'll tell you about Philadelphia. Um, it's a, a teaching and training uh, teaching and training uh, co a collective uh, mm -hmm. based here in Toronto. Uh, we consist of... Uh, uh, traditional martial artists, combat sport players, and tactical combative instructors. Um, uh, we all share our students. We mm. bring our students up. We have local and international seminars. Um, and we're premised on one thing and one thing only, cross-training. We're all mm. about sharing our ideas. Uh, we all are on the same page in terms of, you know, there's more similarities than differences. And the differences are really just defined on purpose and, con yeah. and context, really. Uh, other than that, I mean, we've got... <laughs> We've got the same biomechanical tools, um, and if you strip away style, uh, we're all essentially doing the same thing, man. So yeah. um, uh, Michael at RMI uh, really liked uh, my stuff. He's been following my stuff, and I've been following his stuff, and he just said, hey, man, come on down. So we did, and we had a, a joint uh, cross-training seminar where he focused on uh, what he calls Bunhei because he's a Korean stylist. Mm -hmm. um, and he did some uh, – um, For, for uh, folks who may not know that term, that the – that's kind of the Korean version of bunkai. Generally. Yes, that's right. Uh, applications based on forms and kihons and things like that. And uh, so we we uh, it was such a how could I say a compatible mix because mm. there was no arguments. There was no we weren't being polite. We were being open. We 
it, it was so good. We're going to do something again. Um, oh, but it. we went up there and I met uh, Andy and the Hennis crew. Uh, shout out to Andy. Thank you for this. Um, and uh, yeah, we had, I think, a two, three, two, three day, three day seminar. Um, and I got a chance to tour around Philadelphia, check out the all the ro Rocky uh, stuff, mm -hmm. um, went up the steps and all that and had my first Philly original Philly cheesesteak. How was it? It was dirtily awesome. <laughs> yeah. So you know, wrongfully right. You know what I mean? It was this what are those I can't food? even. It's like this big, <sighs> yeah. juicy, cheesy, oniony, saucy. And, and, I mean, and if you tell people yeah. where you got it, yeah. At least half of them will yell at you and tell you that it's not the authentic one. It's not the real <laughs> one. It's not the right one, right? Right? They they argue. It's like, no, that's not the way to do it. Well, they take that shit seriously. <laughs> they do. They really do. So so it's funny. I, I when I when I uh, I told I told Mike I go Mike I gotta I gotta sh compare our Canadian Philly cheesesteak. And no offense to Canadians <laughs> here, but uh, oh, it was like this small. The bun was hard. It it, it just sucked <laughs> i'm guessing it was like a roast beef sandwich <laughs> yeah it was basically that and it was dry and it was ugh. anyway no comment man <laughs> yeah hashtag i gotta go back again <laughs> well hey hey we, we've got an event coming up uh october uh, september was that 21st 27th whatever you know if you, yeah forget what that saturday is but you know oh if you if you find if you really really have a hankering for a sandwich you know let me know send me some links okay <laughs> I'll do, I'll I'm do. on. I'm on holiday. I'm a. I'm a school teacher here in uh, Toronto, oh, okay. Canada. Um, I teach elementary kids, and uh, I also have a martial art program there too. But more on that later. But uh, so we're on vacation basically uh, till uh, July and August, and then we're back. Yeah. So oh, nice. um, it's open season, man. If 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 it if if the the CEO, i.e., the wife, is okay with it, um, then oh, uh, right. yeah. Let, let's let's talk about this thing that you've built. This. Can we call it an organization or movement? What what would you refer to it as? Uh, it is a training collective. Um, okay. that, you did you did say that? Yes. Yeah, it's a training collective. It's uh, like so. Karate Unity for me is a club. So I mm -hmm. teach. This is my dojo here. I'm filming out of my dojo. So it's a it's a basement dojo. I got mats, mirrors, the whole bit. Mm -hmm. It's retrofitted for a gym space. Um, so I got fitness equipment and bags and blah blah. Um, I teach privately out of here, um, so I can house about five or six people at a time. So I, I do mm -hmm. privates here. Um, so that's that's uh, one piece of Karate Unity. The other piece is uh, I'm a school teacher, so I run a uh, a youth and children's uh, martial art program, and I tie mm -hmm. it into the health and physical education program um, in my school. So it's a it's an excuse to train, oh, cool. and uh, you know. Um, uh, with the kids. And so they love it. They, so they have to, oh, they, they study this stuff and they get a mark for it for health and physical education. Um, oh, nice. Uh, along with sports and, and all the rest yeah. of the uh, Ontario curriculum requirements. But yeah, so that's the second piece of, of the teaching piece in, in Karate yeah. Unity. And the third piece is local and international, lately international, as in the, since COVID, man, um, uh, I've been traveling. Um, and also one year prior to COVID, like 2018, I, I made my first gig to, uh, to Texas to see, I don't know if you know these guys, uh, the Karate Unity, uh, Karate Culture team, um, yeah. uh, with Michael, uh, Michael Wynn and Aaron, uh, and Aaron, um, they started Karate Unity like a long time ago. Uh, I'm sorry, Karate is <laughs> very similar. Karate Culture, Karate Culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah, aware yeah. of what they're doing. I've been following them. Yeah, so I, 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 uh, I went there in 2018 and then, um, what's it, 2019, I, I started Karate Unity. Um, mm -hmm. It was a small little channel, and it's it's growing slowly. Um, and then, based on the content I put out there, uh, the cross training content and things, um, people were inviting me to their country. So, like, I've been to awesome. the UK a couple of times. Um, shout out to uh, I wrote some names down so I don't forget. Yeah, um, yeah. My seminar sponsors: uh, Les Bubka, Brian Bates, John Titchen, and Chris Denwood. Uh, if it wasn't Les for those was on guys, the show not long ago. Great guy. Oh, which one? Which one? Les Bubka was on the show. Les not Bubka, long ago. that's right. He's doing some cool stuff. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's him and Christian Vedavart. Uh, I don't know if you know that name, Christian. No. 
uh, he's uh, you might want to reach out. And if there's anybody that you you uh, want me yeah, to reach and, out and, for you and, and audience, here's a little bit of behind the scenes. This is how we get most of our guests is yeah. somebody will come on the show. And they're like, what do you mean you haven't talked to so and so? And they yeah, connect yeah, yeah. us and we we make it happen. So I yeah, hook you up, man. I hope you appreciate that. But uh, yeah, so if, if you think of something later on, just message me and I'll, I'll get you in touch with these guys. Uh, but Chris, uh, Christian uh, Vedevart, uh, I had to pronounce his name German. Because uh, if Sounded I don't, good it's going to sound like this. Christian Wiedewerdig. Wieder, <laughs> Because well, that's see, how that's, it's spelled. W-E-D-E. As an American, that's that's how most of us we would just you know. <laughs> Wait, where did it? It's actually Vedavart. Yeah, I had to I had to practice that shit, man. That's Vedavart. good. Vedavart. That's good. Yeah. So uh, you're Chris, I, uh, normally I ask the guest, how do I say your name? I didn't have to ask you. Oh, uh, mine is pretty straightforward. Chris Hansen. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so Christian Christian got me on the German path. So after mm-hmm. UK, I, uh, I I went to Germany. I did that last year, um, mm-hmm. and then I came went back. Just came back uh, last week, man. Uh, had a wicked How time. I, uh, we can talk about that later too. Um, I'd love to actually because I had so many amazing experiences and made so many connections. Mm-hmm. One nice. of which is uh, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise and Batman's uh, trainer, um, uh, Defense Lab. Uh, Andy Norman. And okay. I don't know if you know that guy. I've heard From, that name. I, yeah, I, I they, they I were the original founders of KC Fighting Method. Him and okay. uh, I believe a Spanish gentleman, du- Duego, I think, uh, Coach Duego or something like this. Uh, uh, but anyway, they started KC Fighting Method, uh, which is mm-hmm. like a, a kind of like a hybrid hybrid system, a very unique hybrid system of elbows in close, uh, in close uh, clinch uh, fighting, uh, self-protection uh methodology uh mm-hmm. really cool stuff i i got a chance to taste that in germany uh and made uh made some contacts uh there so um i'm going to be having a podcast with uh andy norman uh sometime in august so oh, right it'll, it'll be cool okay he trained nice. he trained uh, uh the batman actor um and uh what's it um he did he did some work for jack reacher and liam neeson and all those guys yeah oh that's super cool yeah. Nice. That'll be that'll be fun. So let's let's go back. Like yes, you know, a lot of us have this this realization that oh, you know, there there's whether it's for political reasons or for uh, skill reasons, right? Like that that bringing people together in the martial arts world would be advantageous. Yeah, and a lot of people go at that in a lot of different ways, and most of them honestly are informal. You know, we're friends. Yep. This school's friends with this school. <clears throat> friends with this school, and they kind of form this loose collective and. Maybe maybe they'll they'll kind of fly a banner as like a tournament circuit. You know, we're all kind of part of this group. But you're. It sounds like what you've done is a, a step beyond that. And anytime somebody's going to put in work, there's a reason. So I, I, I want to know more about the the origin story for Karate Unity. Yeah, for sure. So it, it, you you nailed it. It started off as a as an informal group. Um, I would say Karate Unity started way back um oh god over 25 years ago uh mm-hmm. informally um like i so I'll tell you a bit about my background i'm a karate guy i started uh started training when i was around nine ten years old mm-hmm. um in uh, in a school here in toronto um and then uh, i put in about 14 years there and then i put in another tw- i say 12 years uh so that was in shorinru uh mm-hmm. matsubayashi uh and then i put in about 12 to 13 years in kempo uh Ed Parker style, but it was a Canadian mm-hmm. version because one of the uh, Canadian instructors here uh, uh, certified under Ed, and so he put his little spin on things. And well, because it can't be American Kempo, <laughs> can't be American yeah. Kempo in Canada. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, uh, that kind of opened my eyes out to cross training. I, I when I when I joined the the Kempo group, uh, a lot of guys just coincidentally came from different arts and combat sports and mm-hmm. things, and we were just kind of just feeling each other out, testing each other out. Like, you know, like uh, we would, uh, back in the day, we didn't have internet. It wasn't as big. So um, we would just exchange numbers in the change room and on pieces of paper and say, hey man, let's meet at this guy, at this person's garage. And we got boxing gloves and and all this kind of stuff. Let's test some stuff out and blah, blah. And that's how it started with garage, uh, garage dojos. Um, We just started just banging. And then my, 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 my parents, when I lived in Scarborough, which is a southeastern city in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a, a hub of, of guys all over the city. We, they'd come to my parents' house. 
uh, they'd had a big backyard and we would just mm. bang. We would hit, we would uh, clinch, we would just try out different things. And in a nutshell, we kind of figured out what worked and what didn't work. And I came, I came mm. to a realization that systemically, if we came from the same club, everything worked. But if we came from a different club, things we had to make adaptations and we weren't very good at that. And right. that's where that's the sweet spot where we kind of got winded. Our cardio was tested, our lines of attack, our footwork was tested, the way we'd hold our guard and all of that, man. Um, mm -hmm. So I just kept in touch with these guys. And now uh, some of them, they're my best friends. Uh, oh, cool. They all run dojos. They uh, quite successful and we're just buddies. So we just kind of said, Hey, Let's continue on this tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, so, for example, recently um, I, graded, uh, I graded one of my senior guys and I involved all these guys, uh, some of my close friends in the network. I said, hey, come on down, watch this grading, be part of it. Uh, where I want you as my student. Um, I said I wanted him to cross train with these instructors mm -hmm. and I had no issues with that. I said, listen, you need to go and do some tactical stuff with these guys. You got to go and work grappling with these guys. You got to. Yeah you know, blah, blah, and then come back and let's, let's all work it together. What I'm hearing that yeah. I think makes this really cool is somehow you're finding people that are like-minded. Yeah. You know, these groups exist. There are plenty of these groups. I've been part of these groups. I've seen and talked to so many of them, but not all of them are there for the right reasons. Yeah. Sometimes people join these groups and they're like, uh, uh, uh. I'm going to prove myself, right? They're not going in suspending ego. They're not going in saying, I want to learn as much as possible, right? They're not going in as perpetual students. They're going in at, with, with ego, ego first. That's the and thing. it doesn't work. That's the thing. It doesn't work. And, you know, it's, it's like a, it's like a long-term marriage, a, a good mm. or a good friendship relationship, you know, like it's, uh, there, there has to be like a Venn diagram. Okay. Like here's one person, here's another person. And then we intersect and there's this sliver of commonality and that sliver of commonality, both people have to allow that to flex. It's gotta, mm. gotta be able to, to expand and contract and, and it's gotta be protected between both people. So like, for example, in when I just came back from Germany and it was the ultimate cross training event. It was a karate unity to a T. Mm. So let me give you an example. So, Please. uh, me, Going over there, I'm mm -hmm. bringing cross training ideas over there to these guys. The guy who hosted it, shout out to uh, Karate Noise, um, uh, Defense Lab Dusseldorf, and um, uh, Chris Khan, Chris Kandora from uh, UFC uh, uh, Noise over there. Um, they, we all got together. All of them have their own guys, their own camps, um, and so and there's a division. Uh, there's practical karate, traditional karate, uh, uh, defensive tactics, police defensive tactics. Um, and, uh, what's it, uh, combat sport, MMA, um, hmm. and wrestling and, and this stuff. So we all got together. I met all their guys. We cross trained each, each of us had a particular curriculum that we're showing. We all mixed it up. Um, and then at the end, we didn't kick everybody out. We had complimentary beer. We ordered some food. We stayed back for like, no one wanted to leave, man. And then yeah. we were having all these informal conversations whilst we're eating our pizza and drinking. And we're, you know, we put it down and we're testing and trying stuff out and talking about the event. And, bro, it was love. <laughs> you know it what sound, I'm saying? It sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's what you're describing. Yeah. You know, I've, I've seen it. You know, we see it at our events because, you know, we, we've got some filters up. People don't tend to show up to our events, at least not more than once if they've yep. got a lot of ego. Because we don't, you know, it's just not the, the scene for that. But I've seen this in rugby. Yeah. And I see this a lot in amateur MMA. Yep. And the commonality is without my opponent, I can't do what I love doing. Yeah. Right. And it, it's, you know, uh, I, I don't know what the economics of rugby looks like in outside of the U.S., but I don't think anybody in the U.S. is making money playing rugby, just as most of the people <laughs> that are, are stepping into a, a ring for amateur MMA they would love to move on, but they know they're not going to. They're doing it because it's something they enjoy. And without that person on the other side who's willing to give it their all, and I think that's the commonality. Yeah. It's willing to just sm smash arms, legs, faces with them. You're not going to learn as much. And there's a respect for that that doesn't always happen in other places. It, I, I agree. Um, 
that that level of physicality that in the now in the moment kind of thing it's like a it's like it's like once we start drilling or sparring or whatever we're doing um it's kind of like a a contract it's like we mm. shut up and just train and if we get tagged or whatever the conversation's tight. It's like, how'd you do that, man? Show me, right. you know, and instant friends, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, uh, instant friends. It's like, I had a train of thought here. I was lost it. Um, okay. It'll come back to me though. Um, there's, there's really something to be yeah. said for a willingness to put your body on the line for oh, someone God, else's benefit. Say. Because that's really what it is. Yeah, put yourself on the line, um, and also, also, uh, uh, the whole cross training piece. It's mm -hmm. like this is so key, man. Like, okay, uh, back on the back on, on to, into sports. So uh, I had a, a really cool conversation with uh, uh, my my wife's um, uh, bet, one of my wife's best friend's husband, and he's re he's a Greek guy. He's really into soccer. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, he was he was talking about this soccer friend of his. He, who's a pro, pro or mm -hmm. semi-pro? Uh, he, 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 uh, he. What's it? Uh, he plays at a very high level, and guess what he does on his on his training days, his off training days? He goes and cross trains. You ready for this? In racket sports, okay. So he would three kinds. So he would go and put himself in a squash court, mm -hmm. and he says that that confined space. Mm. Um, and that, you know, dropping and, and, and changing angles and stuff really and just hard. continuously going, he goes, that translates directly into my footwork for soccer. Yeah. Um, and then he goes, the, then he, then he cross trains with high level ping pong guys and I'm going ping pong. I go, why? He goes, because that fine motor skill of moving my hands and keeping my eye on a very fast moving target along yeah. with keeping my footwork really tight and, yeah. and and be able to move left and right and back and forth and, and adjust to distances and stuff that Makes translates sense. directly to my soccer as well yeah right so my point and so then then I'm I'm thinking oh my god the, all of these examples are all hitting me it's all confirmation of what I'm doing so then then we all know who Arnold Schwarzenegger is right mm -hmm. well when you take a look at that guy we all know, uh, unless well, I shouldn't say we all know. If you if you d d dig deep into his training background, he he uh, cross trained in ballet so mm -hmm. that he can improve his um, uh, what's it posing, posing. routine um, and his transitions between his poses. Yep. Um, so that's why I that's why I've set all this up because mm -hmm. I've seen so many examples of. A win-win situation where you get martial arts, combat sport players, tactical combative guys. Yeah, they all have different purposes, but we're all bound by one thing, biomechanical principles. And once we once we can see that, we can have a language of martial arts. We can speak mm -hmm. this language, and then we can communicate each other, with each other why are we doing things differently and learn from that, you know? Um Totally agree. Yeah. You know, one of the things, if you if you listen to any athletic trainer at a, a high level, whether they're college level or pro level, they will all tell you that the people who cross train and, and I, we're we're kind of, I'm kind of extending the definition of cross training here. Yeah. But the the athletes that come up that were not single sport athletes, they are better overall and they have less risk of injury. Yes. There is a value to diversity when you were are talking strictly about the physical body now Love that we could we can certainly talk about martial arts and talk about the art side of it and suggest yes there's more value depending on your goals if you you know really hone in i want to be the best at you know shorinru or, or ishinru or uh wt taekwondo right yep. like you, you can make that argument but if you strictly want to approach it from the physicality, the language of how the body moves, you really can't argue the value of diversity. 100%, man. I, I love that phrase. I actually wrote it down too, the value of diversity. I, 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 uh, I'm a geek this way. Like if I, I, anywhere I go, any person I speak to, if I come across a nugget like this, like what you just said, it, it'll resonate with me. So, uh, I will give you a shout out once I well, thank you. find it's, some it, way to use it. <laughs> this is how yeah. we get better, right? Like yeah. it's not just it's not just 
smashing arms and legs together. It's how we talk about it. It's how we think about it. My favorite thing about what I do, and I suspect that you also love this because you have a podcast, is getting people on and yeah. hearing their thoughts and yeah. sort of mentally pressure testing yeah. how you think. Yeah. I love when I get somebody on the other end of the mic who disagrees with me on something. Because yeah. that's where I'm going to focus my time because I want to understand them as well as possible because it's either going to reinforce my belief or it's going to change my belief. Which makes and you I think of a different way. Outcome. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's it's good. I I uh I love I love that too. Like uh, I I don't know if you heard of uh, Ando Mirzwa. Do you know who he is? Sensei Ando. He 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 loves pushing the envelope on on <laughs> everything. You know what I'm saying? Yes, so, he does. So I had I had him on my podcast. He, I was on his podcast, and we were just like button heads, but but in a good way because he's just a great guy. You know. Well, I, you know, Ando's been on a few times, and I and I think the world of Ando. Yeah. I think sometimes he likes pushing buttons for the sake of pushing buttons. Yeah. I yeah. think I I yeah. I don't I haven't asked him that, but I think I know him well enough, and I think I've listened yeah, to yeah, enough yeah, of his yeah, stuff yeah. to say. Yeah, I feel click, like sometimes click, Ando's click, playing the click, contrary. Click, yeah. click. <laughs> he's a he's a, he's a really good dude. Yeah, but um, what I was gonna say, man, ah, oh, I, I I think I'm getting older, and my mind's just drifting. Sometimes I just because sometimes at school, like I I'm in the middle of a lecture, and I lose my train of thought. But uh, it was about cross. What do you teach? Uh, what you grade you're a I teach? teacher. Yeah, well, I, what, I teach what? at the elementary panel. So that goes okay. all the way from kindergarten, say four or five or six, all the way up to uh, 13, 14, grade eight. Okay. So I, I've been uh, teaching uh, lately, as in the last 20 some odd years, um, grades four, five, and six. Yeah, I just mm -hmm. I hover around that. Uh, that age uh, range. So next year, and, and my is, assignment in September is grade six. Yeah. Is the the Canadian public school system similar to the U.S. where you would teach pretty much all subjects to yeah, those kids? Yeah, we're generalists. Yeah. Uh, we teach everything except, though, um, when you get to grade seven and eight, uh, you, uh, you can specialize. So based on, mm -hmm. say, your uh, university degree or the courses you've taken as a teacher you can specialize in a particular subject like mathematics or science or something like that but uh i haven't i, I i've done that before uh when i when i did teach grade seven and eight but i i much prefer to teach uh the middle grades because uh it's a sweet spot you know mm -hmm. they uh they still laugh at your jokes and um they're kind of getting into puberty so they're kind of moody but but you, can still, still you can still tell them what's up, right? Like yeah, they, yeah, they're, yeah. They're they're mature yeah. enough that you can have some conversation with them. You can you can get in depth. They have a, a really strong personality, yes. but they're not jerks yet. No, not complete no. jerks. Not complete, but they'll call you out on stuff. Call you out on stuff, but you got you got to show them what's up. You know, right from That's the beginning, right. right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um. Yeah, I, I lost my train of thought of what I was going to say, okay. say to you, but uh, it, it'll come back. It'll come back. I, I don't <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I'm yeah. losing my mind, too. Did we talk about how you got started training? Like, did we go back? To no, the very beginning? no, we didn't. So okay. I, I guess we could talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah, I uh, so um, I grew up in Toronto. Uh, I, I'm 54 years old. I was born in 1968. Um, okay. and it was a racially tense time in the sixties, uh, especially in Toronto. Hmm. Um, lots of oh, racism. Are you, toward... are you not, are you not white? <laughs> well, my last name's Hanson, Chris Hanson. <laughs> well, Where's... there are people, okay. There are people who are going to listen to this and not watch. Yeah. And I yeah. feel like we kind of got to let them know at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so Especially I, I if mean, you're gonna go there. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is all in fun, man. Um, but then again, that means nothing these days. <laughs> right. But no, like I, my name uh, actually was an Asian name, like way back. Uh, it, the the story goes, my great 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 grandfather. Uh, the name was Han Seng Tam, so H A N S E N G, like the Han Seng stock yeah. market. Han Seng yeah. Tam, but. Um, all of this, uh, there was an anglicization of the names uh, in right. India back in the 1930s because uh, my parents are my and my my relatives and all that are from India, mm -hmm. India and China. 
And there was this anglicization going on because of the colonization and all right. this stuff. And they stripped names and forced uh, certain ethnic groups to change names and blah, blah. So, yeah, our families uh, got subjected to that. And, mm. and I was thinking at some point to change my name back to, you know, the original name. But, you know, hey, man, I, I'm a Hanson. I, I, I am who I am. I I. I am who I am. So I It's cool I kept, that you know that history though. Yeah, yeah. So I kept my name, but uh what didn't change was, you know, just people are just idiots, right? Like uh <laughs> we treated each other human beings just suck, uh, you know, t- towards each other, you know, like we really do. Um mm-hmm. and it's history repeats itself. So, you know, no matter how many uh equitable kind of initiatives you're gonna have, there's always gonna be an imbalance. And um mm-hmm. so anyway, growing up in the sixties, I was the only Asian kid in my class and I was getting made fun of and you know, I, I people would flick my ears. I had I had actually surgery on my ears. I had my ears my ears were actually sticking out like this. Um yep. Uh, but I had him pinned back because yep. my 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 mom didn't want me uh, bullied and and mm. stuff like this. So I, I I had all this bullying. It's a very typical story, you know, Asian yeah. kid getting bullied in school. So I had, my dad gave me a choice. He says, "Listen, dude. He goes, uh, you're gonna play hockey or you're gonna do martial arts. Take your pick." I go, "No, no, 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 no. I don't want to do hockey. All, all all the white guys are in the hockey team. I don't I don't want to play there. They're gonna beat me up. You know what I'm saying?" <laughs> so so I said, "I'm gonna try something different." So, uh, uh, you know, I, I did martial arts, the karate. I, I yeah. just, I need to take a moment because because we're clearly there. Like like yeah. we're getting along. Like I can tell we're good. Yeah. I so for for folks who are do not live practically in Canada as I do, you yeah. may not understand how pervasive hockey is. Yes. Hockey in Canada is more pervasive than any American sport. Oh, if it's you a grow mecca up in here, Canada, man. You yeah. are assumed to play hockey. <laughs> from roughly the time you can stand up. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it's I, in our blood. I just love that that the offer your father gave you was <laughs> hockey or because you're the Asian king getting picked on, yeah. martial arts. Yeah. That, that's like it. there's there's something in there that I'm just like the two in contrast, I, I don't I there's a joke there. I don't I don't even know that I need to find it because it's just funny. <laughs> But please continue. So I said, I said to my dad, I go, dad, there's no way in hell I'm going to do hockey, bro. You know, these guys are like, I'm not that tall. So I'm like, I haven't grown since I was 13, bro. I'm five, Mm. five, six. I've grown muscular wise, but the height, I'm vertically challenged. You know what I'm saying? So these, these guys were massive beasts, bro. So I I said, nah, I, I, I'm going to do this karate thing. Right. And so. So check this out. I went in uh, to this club, my first Shornru club, and oh, I could breathe. There were white guys, black guys, yellow guys, Chinese, Filipino, big guys, skinny guys, muscular guys, tall guys, like, people who were shy, people who couldn't even speak. Mm. They had like 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 impediments, and mm. I was going, "Oh, I'm at home. This is great." And and How we would do. I was ten when I started. Uh, I'm 54 now. I, 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 to be honest, I haven't stopped training. I maybe took a, a, about a year or two off, but yeah. I haven't stopped training. I've been but continuously to, training to to, um, to get that at that age, and to be able and to have that feeling to be. It's it's sad that you had the awareness of what what was out there to create that contrast. That's yeah. the part that is is blowing my mind. But everything happens for a reason, man. And for I, sure. I, Dad, if you're gonna listen to this. Love to you because you got me here. My my dad's the backbone of karate, man. Karate unity, mm-hmm. you know. Like he, if it wasn't for him forcing me to go to karate class, you know, when I was ten, I wouldn't be here. But mm-hmm. uh, so you know, I, I met a ton of people who were like when I started to get to know them, they were all bullied to some degree. They're every and, and you know what? Let's face it. The, the longer you speak to any human being on this planet, we're all carrying some sort of a cross, man. Yeah. You know, we're on this planet together, man. And that that's that's where people forget, you know, we're that's 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 what's driving me to unity, too. It's more than just, hey, let's all cross chain. No, it's like, let's all get together and understand we're all human beings here, you know, uh, and sure. we need to help each other in some way, shape or form. Martial arts is just a vehicle, yep. um, you know, uh, but could, anyway, couldn't agree more. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. I, I don't know if you've ever heard us say this but our express purpose as whistle kick i want everybody in the world to train for six months yes i don't think there's any better short short-term 
high short investment, high return, reward, personal yeah. growth kind of methodology than martial arts, right? Like, you know, people grow up and you, you've probably heard this, you know, I, I did like eight months of Taekwondo when I was a kid and it was really good for me. Yeah. I never hear someone say, you know, I played like half a season of basketball. It was really good for me. I want my kid to do that. Like, yeah, you don't yeah, yeah. hear that very often, but you right. hear all the time about martial arts. A hundred percent. I, I, I think there's no activity like it. I mean, there's, uh, I, I get into all these kind of circular arguments with my friends who are really good at sports and stuff. Oh, we got the same, man. It's just training, you know, and there's just the brotherhood, you know, like, yeah, but it's, it's, uh, in martial arts, it's, it's more than that, man. It's, it's, there's spirituality involved, you know, and there's this, this retrospection and, uh, introspection going on. And, uh, we could talk for hours on that. It's, uh, unreal. The, the diff I think the difference, you know, if you if you take the example of like a football team, yeah, you might have a coach who's really dialed and they insist on their players showing up on time and being respectful and doing all these things. But that is considered external to what they do. That is a condition that they must satisfy to do the thing that they want to do. Yes. Whereas those very same things are part of what we do showing up to class on time and being respectful is part of being a martial artist in training as a martial artist yes 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 it's 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 all encompassing yeah like the sport the sport paradigm you talk about is very i could say very specific like here's a here's b i gotta get to b mm -hmm. from a and uh, i'm a coach i know how to do this i've got a lot of experience going from a to b on a competitive level. So I'm going to push you towards A to B in the shortest way, you know, and, right. and, but, but, you know, having said that, I know some coaches, uh, my friends that, that have, that are coaches and have, have had coaches that they invite over to their house. They're part of the family. They're, you know, they're mentors, they're family members right. too, you know? So th there is this, I think it's, that's how you make it. Right. But, but, uh, but martial arts naturally does that. Yeah. It's it's like my senseis were my dad figures. Right. Um same. They cared about me, man. You know, they got involved in all my problems and school related too. They were, you know, always yep. on top of things with me and everybody in that group, you know. So it's a little different. <laughs> yeah. It is. I see your point. Yeah. It is for sure. Have you bumped into any pushback with Karate Unity? Hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, bro. Talk 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 about that. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, misery loves company, right? <laughs> it does. Let's talk some dirt. Okay. Well, you know, um, in a nutshell. Oh man, there's so many so many ways to go with this. The biggest problem I find, the pushback I find, is they're trying to understand what the hell it is. They see mm. they they see a karate guy, uh, like if if I could turn my camera, if you take a look yeah. at say the banner here, yeah. okay, it says it says karate unity, uh, unity unity through cross training the karate tradition of evolution, um, and then you see all these different icons and mm -hmm. images of all the different arts, right? So my my premise is look, I'm a karate guy, but I get so much value in touching hands with all these other people. And I really believe they should all come together and we should all learn from each other to make our base art better. So if you mm -hmm. take a look at our, at my catchphrase in the beginning of a lot of my videos, you know, I go, hi, uh, Chris Hansen, welcome to Karate Unity. Our content focuses on cross training and our other arts and combat sports to make your base art better. And in my case, it's karate. Done, right? So I try to, you know, over the years, I try to get that mission clear and I try to continuously have repetitive messages out there. Like, look, so, um, we have this thing called kata and kihon. Uh, they're really just a set, a catalog set of biomechanical principles. Um, as is, they can't, you can't use it for fighting. Um, but then that kind of separates a whole bunch of camps of karate guys because immediately some of these guys say, well, no, our kata is everything and kata is fighting and blah, blah. And, and I'm saying to myself, well, if you've ever tried using kata in a fight, well, all the power to you because I can't, and maybe I'm not good enough, but I just can't. I can't, I can't, I can't do anything with a chambered punch. Um, I have to do stuff with it. 
um, and use the ideas behind it. And so when I cross train with other people, I unlock these things. It's like some of these, like there's a lot of these uh, bunkai specialists out there who, who don't want to attach their movements to say a, a high percentage grappling art, like, like BJJ and wrestling Mm -hmm. and judo and stuff. Like, I'm sorry, but those three camps that I just mentioned, BJJ, judo and wrestling, they do that particular specialty very well, Mm -hmm. you know? And if you take a look at little snapshots of movements, of course you can make a biomechanical argument to, yeah, karate has it too. Mm -hmm. But I have never seen to this date a karate guy who can grapple like a wrestler, a judo guy, or a BJJ guy, right? right? Um, When I cross train with these guys, it unlocks ideas for my karate, but I can't claim that, hey, we've had it already. And, and, and there's camps of karate guys out there that are, are pushing this brand that, you know, we have, we have everything. It's all there. Um, and I don't necessarily see it. I see, okay, let me, let me clarify. I see everything as far as biomechanical movement, biomechanical principles, all there. Everything's all there, but that's a default. We're human beings. Of course, we're going to have it there. Right. But you need to branch out and, and talk to these talk to the specialists who are actually doing it under live pressure on, in, in a competitive arena or if, say for uh, their job, uh, say tactical combative instructors mm-hmm. or whatever. These are the guys that I think you get value from. So the pushback I get, uh, sorry, that was a long winded answer, but nope. the pushback I get from good. traditional guys, you're not doing karate. You're doing some sort mm-hmm. of a hashmash Jeet Kune Do. You're, you're basically a knockoff of Bruce Lee. <sighs> You know, um, so, come on, man. You you only put in 20 yeah. something years in karate. You didn't put in long enough. You don't understand karate. Right. And then and then I get pushed back from all the guests that I get online. Like I, I have guests from everywhere. You know, I, I'm not a big guy, but I, I uh, big in terms of uh, my channel. But I have I love talking to different people for different views. And as you said, it's challenging. It's good. Yeah. Right. Um, and so the traditional guys going, why, why, for example, I had, um, John Hackleman from UFC, UFC, uh, fight trainer. Um, one of the most effective martial <laughs> art, traditional martial artists. Cause if you know his history, yes. Yes. who has been able to translate traditional martial arts yep. into ring functionality. Yeah. And I had boss root on my John. channel too. Bas Love boss. Same, yeah. same deal. Yeah, you've spoken to him before? Yeah, they've, they've both been on the show. Let's think the world of both of them. Perfect. Yeah, you you have actually, by the way, shout out to you. Uh, guys, if you have not come across Whistle Kick, get on it, man. It's an amazing channel with all kinds of variety of, uh, well, we're of gonna, speakers. We're going to clip that out right there. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to. We're just, I'm just, I'm just going to take out ads just everywhere of you saying that. Yeah, man, why not? Whistle kick, do it. <laughs> but uh, now, um, Keep going. B- Bass Rutten um, and John Hackerman. Okay, I had pushback from these two guests, for example, saying like John. John's a joker, right? Like John. John yep. goes. I-, I go. John, what, what's your what's your take on uh, on Kata? Oh, and so you big... were just stirring the pot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I, I just wanted him to say that because he's funny, right? So right. he goes. Uh, he goes. He pauses and he goes. Uh, well. Uh, have you heard of the genre of dance called pop locking, Chris? <laughs> I love hack. And then he's he's doing this, right? He's going, he's going to me, Kata's like pop locking. You know? He go and he goes, I'm just kidding. He goes, Look, um, I'm a traditional guy. I've done Kempo, Hawaiian Kempo, this and that. And he goes, We've got katas and forms. He goes, but I, I've put it in its place in what I think it's its place. He goes, I teach it for I teach it too. He goes, but I teach it to people who want to learn it as a separate entity. He goes, yeah. as far as functionality goes, he goes, you know, I have a mix of kickboxing, grappling, uh, you know, a self-defense curriculum and things like that. And you know, I try to, he goes, I, I kind of don't see a, a similarity between what we do in Kata and what the applications. And that's where him and I differ because I actually see a ton of similarity uh, because, you know, the, the, the yep. Katas itself kind of give you a biomechanical, it's kind of like you go to Home Depot and you get this, a tool, tool set package. And then mm. you take off the shrink wrap and you have all these tools in this package on its own, like it, t- together, they don't really make sense. But when you take it out, they all have function and you got to use it in different ways. So I, 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 I 
try to talk to him like that about it, and he still went back to the pop locking thing, and you know, you know um, it, it, everybody <laughs> trains for different reasons, and that's okay. Right. But you actually said something that that kind of extends a metaphor I've used quite a bit. If if similar to something you've said, I say it as there are only so many ways the body can move, and only some of those make sense with respect to combat, right? So martial arts is, there are some things like, I'm probably not going to do this in a martial arts context. My body will do this. And for the listeners, I'm patting myself on top of the head. Yeah. But there's a reason every martial art has some way of taking my hand and making a fist and sticking it out, right? Some yeah. manner of punch. That makes sense. Those individual elements become a language. Yeah. Now, I started with karate. So even though I've done Taekwondo and I've done kickboxing, I've trained in a number of other things, I st my body still thinks of it as karate. It's still yep. in my brain all karate, just as I've met people who start with Kempo. And everything, their proprioception all relates back to Kempo, the way you could ask them to do a karate kick. And their brain is still making a translation from, okay, this is the way, this is the Kempo way, and I got to do make this adjustment here. And I, I experienced the same thing, one of the... Uh, I've, I've heard for many, many years, you do all your Taekwondo forms like a karate person. Well, that, that makes yeah. sense because I started, right? That's how I see it. Yeah. But if we, if we take that metaphor and we run out with it a little bit further, you could think of, I, I think of uh, kata forms as like a story or a poem. Yes. That th maybe there's, there's value in learning to write that poem or recite that poem, memorize that poem but I'm probably never going to be out in public and just rattle off that string of words in that order with that cadence. Right. And to go even further, I might have a whole bunch of words that I know that might be similar in other languages. Right. So you could say, yeah, you know what? I know Spanish because I can say the word no. But that doesn't really mean I know Spanish. So that's kind of what you were talking about with, you know, karate saying that it has these grappling moves. Yeah, you can get there. It might not be the most efficient way to get there. If I want to learn Spanish, yeah, I could identify all the words in English that have carryover. But I'm probably better served if I want to learn Spanish to go learn Spanish. Love it. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I have a different uh well, a complimentary uh metaphor to add oh, in, i want to hear spoken, it, please spoken about it in many ways uh it's uh i've used the the idea of a note musical note mm. and the idea of an alphabet right so so for example uh let, let's get into the alphabet piece so i i've used this in my seminar so like if you take the letter uh if you take the letter a Okay, and I'm, I'm just for the for the people who can't see, I'm writing a letter A here. In on a case piece of someone paper. doesn't know the letter A. Yeah, and and I, I, I'm assuming that you know English. Okay, the letter A. Okay, consists of you know those lines, right? And right. but you know if I once you've learned once you know this and learn it, I can tilt it sideways. I can create a different mm -hmm. font. I can uh, add like maybe some graphics to it and make make it graphical, right? Where I put some sort of graphic in the center, yeah. but it's got the general geography of an it's, A. It's still and, an A. And so people are going to understand that, right? Um, and, and in that context, right? So, I mean, like, so let's just talk about notes. Mm. If you have a, notes is a universal language in music, okay? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where you go, which country it is, a note is a note, okay, on, on, that, on that scale. And you can combine the notes to make uh, a scale, which really is part of music, but mm -hmm. it's not composed music. Then you can compose, use those notes to make a composure, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a composition and play. And then you can cross uh, cross play with, say, uh, your jam. Your jam. So, like, uh, what I love to see sometimes is in, in downtown Toronto uh, near the waterfront. Um, and I was talking to Ando about this a while back at, at our, one of our podcasts. Um, you get these guys that uh, – that are just carrying around their 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 guitar and they see mm. another guitarist and then a violinist comes by and then a guy who's got a keyboard comes by guy with an amp has he has his amp and stuff and they're all making music together man yeah you know what i mean uh, uh, based jamming. on a common notes right so to me that's martial arts i like that you know 
um, that's how it should be seen, in my opinion. You, you have all these styles, and as Bruce Lee would say, styles end up being a crystallization of the truth, you know? Um, and so if you strip away style, uh, you just have biomechanical movements, biomechanical notes, biomechanical tools, biomechanical alphabets, and then you can learn, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. I like it. I like it. Mm. Um, so yeah, the, the notes idea and the alphabet idea kind of resonates with me a lot. Um, mm. And that kind of makes me like, like I, uh, it, it's funny, you know, I kind of related to what we were saying before, you know, we, you see these seminars out there and they say open to all styles, systems and ranks. Okay. But really, are you though? Are you really open to all system styles and ranks? Because you take a look at the photos and all the aftermath on social media, you see everybody more or less wearing, coming from the same mm -hmm. organization or groups of organizations. Yep. You know, uh, in Germany, I, I'm not tooting my own here, but it, I, I'm, I'm tooting something. I'm tooting some truth here. In Germany, I kid you not, there were guys wearing geese, combat sports shorts, uh, compression yeah. fittings. Uh, I, I've heard this is a common thing in Europe that they are far <laughs> less divisive, divided. Yeah. Than, oh, there's a big traditional group there too, but they're more open minded, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, from, you know, that's why I, I go back. I mean, Germany is my place now, man. You know, I, I, I love going there. But yeah, maybe, maybe it was it's... nice to see. That's what I was trying to say. It's like, it's yeah. like we truly invited people from everywhere bro they were grapplers strikers uh tactical guys they were and everybody didn't give a shit we were just learning from each other we had pizza and beer after bro it, you know it like it's <laughs> yeah and, and you know this is where you know long long time audience members know like i love bringing on people who have a podcast who are working on things that on the surface are um I, I guess competitive. Yeah. For a number of reasons. One, this is a big mission that I've got that we have, like it, it's going to yeah. require a lot of us working on it. Number one, number two, if somebody starts putting out stuff that's better. Well, that's going to force me to get better, right? It's, it's the same philosophy that we bring into our training. It's if a community, you don't man. have people that are better than you, you are not going to improve. Yeah. You're going to be complacent. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, that's another pushback I get to. You asked me, uh, you know, what are some pushbacks yeah. I get in karate is, is they, one of the biggest pushbacks is, you know, uh, they don't understand what I'm doing. So therefore they see what they see is they see a guy that's just dabbled, dabbled in a lot of things. And what, what they don't understand is, is what they don't see. Like I, I don't showcase every single thing I do on social media. I, I'm pretty <clears> active, <throat> but I, they don't know who I really am. I train bro every day. Um, pretty much, you yeah. know, I, I'll take maybe the weekend off sometimes, but I train every day and I have partner, I have, uh, I have guys coming down here, uh, that train with me every week, mm. um, and uh, on a, on a teaching level. And then just for training, like to me, it's not about going out there and I want to be the biggest karate guy in the world and, you know, have this and that and blah, blah, blah. Like that's not me. Um, mm. I value training, bro. I'm insecure about a lot of the things that I don't know that I just want to keep going and getting better. Bro, when I came back from Germany, oh, the skill level of these guys, yeah. unbelievable, bro. You know, yeah. the range, the level of uh, cardio, the conditioning, the uh, just the mindset. You probably um, had some moments where you're like, why am I standing up in front? Yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> I'm know going, Jesus feeling. Christ, bro. Like I, like, I came back, I videotaped the shit out of stuff. I got a ton of content. And so stay tuned, Karate Unity. We're going to have a lot of stuff coming, coming down. <laughs> but but uh, uh, I just got to make the time to edit. But uh, the point is, uh, I was very humbled by this. And so mm -hmm. therefore, what does that mean? In my private practice now, I'm literally yesterday and the day before, I was working stuff that I sucked at over the seminar. You know, and I just That's kept you going. you working and on. Yeah, and I it's, put my ass in a in a MMA gym, and why MMA? Because it's highly athletic. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, I'm 54. I'm training. The average age there is 22, dude. 22 to 25. And these guys are kicking my ass, and I love that shit because yeah. it, it it keeps me going. You know, yeah. um, so I train a lot, and uh, I continue to train. People don't know that, and 
Um, you know, I think it's time to get to know each other before we judge. Um, and the thing is, I, I want to train so much that I want to get people together and we all share, you know, mm. and, and like, it, it's just a beautiful thing, you know? Um, but yeah, that's a big misconception. It's like, oh, you're dabbling in a lot of things and mm -hmm. you don't really have a core understanding. Um, and again, you know, people, they're a function of what they know. They're a function of their organization. Um, yep. And I respect this, their opinions because, I, hey, I was there before. When I was a, a traditional, traditional quote, tradition, unquote, uh, traditional guy, our teachers would hate us cross training, would hate us looking at other things. We would just, we would have to be, have to be loyal to our club, you know, and yep. not go anywhere else. Well, I don't know. Times are changing now. You know? They are. They are. Yeah. The internet's brought a lot of this in. And, and I'll, you're, you're, I've brought this up, I think, probably two or three times on the show, and I, I suspect you'll appreciate this. I can disprove the uh, tunnel vision loyalty with logic, that that, that is a better approach. Not yep. to say that you shouldn't focus on something, but here here's the logical proof. Yep. If you're my instructor, let's say you are ordained by God with brilliant knowledge at the age of 10 and I start at five, right? And I get 75 years with you, 80 years with you. Am I ever going to be you? If you're right. the keeper of what this information is, right. am I ever gonna be good? No, I might be 99 with a whole bunch of nines, but I'm never gonna be 100%. And yep. so if I take that and I bring it to my student, and somehow we get the same amount of time. Now my student is slightly worse through that lens, through that perspective. Yes. It is the only way it can go. But if instead I'm not prioritizing, I have to be that body of information from my instructor, but rather this is the focus of my study and I am developing myself with my own martial arts and I bring in some elements elsewhere. Now I have the opportunity, maybe I don't take it, but I have the opportunity to become better than my instructor. And if you don't want your students to be better than you, you're a terrible person and you should not be in front of the room. Yep. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I wanted to compliment that with uh, Steve Jobs. Okay, so here's, here's another example. Uh, founder of Apple, okay? Mm -hmm. um, he's dead now, but he's left his legacy. Uh, and it's continuing. Okay. Yep. Um, if, if people who are running Apple just stopped at what Steve Jobs left off at, it would be a terrible company. Right. <laughs> yeah, it, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, S Steve Jobs has created like an amazing uh, cell phone platform, mm -hmm. um, simple to use, uh, uh, you know, very uh, portable and all this stuff. Uh, easy to see. Why? Because he cross-trained in different disciplines. He looked at uh, mm. Asian, he did Asian studies. He went to Japan, I believe, for a while. He studied minimalism. He, he studied art. And he took all these things and elements and poured it into his, into his, uh, into his hardware and software. Mm -hmm. uh, and, he, and, he, and he disseminated all of this to his team. And all these guys started to understand the value of this cross-platform thinking. Uh, open, uh, as you would say, uh, I wrote it down here, diversity, the value of diversity, right? Um, and, and so there's this evolution that kept going on, kept, kept going on. And like, mm. uh, okay, look, um, Master Vic Arnold was one of my, one of my uh, teachers. Okay. Cool. Um, he passed away, uh, at 2015, I believe, 2014, 2015. Um, he, he would always tell me, he says, look, uh, I don't know how much how much time I have left on this planet. He goes, but he goes, travel, train, teach, and share. Go out there, bring it back, put it all in a pot. We'll all eat it together. It'll be like a potluck. All these masters are bringing their stuff in. It's like a potluck. We're all going to enjoy this meal together. Um, and he goes, and when I'm gone, he goes, you got to go out there and, 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 and create as many potlucks as possible, you know, where everybody's bringing stuff together and we're enjoying it together, you know? That, um, that is a and, and so here, here's the conundrum. So there's these karate groups that try to preserve what, what their last memory of, uh, of their master. And they're trying to preserve that. But what 
it's it's so frustratingly wrong because if you take a look at the histories, for example, of Sensei Nagamini, for example, okay, he's uh, one of the Shonru founding fathers mm -hmm. of Matsubayashi. -ru. He cross trained in kendo. He looked at judo. He 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 did some police combatives because he was a police guy, um, and he looked at aikido and all these things. And he wrote about the dynamic nature of wrestling and boxing. Mm -hmm. He wrote about it and. Um, can't say he actually practiced it, but he he was thinking it, okay? And it, it definitely came out in his liter literature, okay? But then he died, right? right. Now, um, if, if you're going to do justice to that, you're going to take it and run with it, you know? And you're going to continue on. So what, he died in the 1980-something? Now we're in the 2000s. I mean, people, people should be taking Matsubayashi Ru and cross-training and making it theirs, not his, you know what I'm saying? I, yeah. I think there's a place for preservation. There right? is. We, we could, you know, there are, you know, if we think about other forms of art, if we, we take physical art out of it, we think about painting, right? Somebody could get really good at painting in the Impressionist style, even though that, that is not considered a contemporary style. We've kind of moved on with that. But you can still preserve that and work on the modern things. You could still learn to tattoo in the traditional Japanese way with, with, with the knives, but you can also learn how to tattoo with modern equipment and accomplish other things. They don't have to, they don't have to exist. Uh, they can exist independently. They don't have to be exclusive. Yep. Yep. That's, that's how I look at, at forms, right? I, I told you most of the audience know it. I grew up with karate, so I learned my katas. I made adjustments to my katas when I went into competition. Yeah. Went into open competition. I had to remember both versions. My instructors didn't mind. They said, that's fine. You go do that. But when you're in class, you do it the, the way we taught you. Totally fine. Yeah. I, can, I can see those two operating independently. They have value in different contexts. Yes. Value in different contexts, for sure. I, I, uh, I just uh, another example of this. A lot of people bash whatever uh, this term called three K karate, karate kumite and uh, kata karate and no kata, kata kumite kihon kata kihon and what's kumite. the other one kumite yeah. And that you know uh, Ian Abernathy, for example, uh, you know has a wonderful argument for synergizing all of those three together. Mm -hmm. um, and some s camps they separate it and blah blah. And you know there's this criticism for, for you know I learned kata like this where I'm in the center. Uh, there's someone beside me, someone beside me here, someone in front of me, and someone behind me. And they're there to give me a stimulus, uh, you know, so that I can, mm -hmm. in my opinion, remember the technique. Right. Um, you know, and, and as a school teacher, you know, uh, I teach kids with all kinds of needs and exceptionalities mm -hmm. and uh, emotional and social backgrounds and blah, blah. And all of these things, if I can find a learning tool or a way to help a student remember something or help them understand something, then I'm going to do it. So I don't see anything wrong with 3K, with, with this method where someone's beside you, they're going to throw a kick and you're going to drop a gedan. Well, I might not. Uh, use that low block to block a kick, but it's going to help me remember that the first move opening this way is going to be, okay, right. a kick's coming. It's going to help me remember I got to drop my hand. Um, so I, when I see a lot of this criticism online uh, and forums and stuff, I say, well, 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 stop the madness, guys. There's use for all of this. Let's look at it from a positive point of view. It's going to help your, your students remember the curriculum. Uh, but now if you're talking self-defense, <laughs> different ball game, you got to, you got to now, um, use that. You got to make some changes to it. Sure. Right? Yeah. Why we train should be reflected in what and how we train. The why and the yes. And as long as it is, as long as those reconcile, you're fi everybody's fine. But yep. people look at why they train and how and what and when and who with they train. And then they look at somebody else and they assume that their reason for training is the same but they see it translating out into different what and how and when, et cetera. And so they say, you're wrong. Now, if their why is the same, then yes, maybe there's a way that they could improve. But if their why is different, I don't train primarily for self-defense. I live in the woods. 
in yeah. one of the safest places on earth. Yep. I'm good. Yep. I train for other reasons. Yep. If I happen to have to move to some place that's more violent, I'm probably going to spend more time working on my my self defense stuff. Yep. My why yep. is going to change, and so my what and my how, etc., change. Same. Uh, I'm. I uh, live in North America in Toronto, Canada, in a relatively peaceful place. I pay my taxes. Uh, you know, have a small family. I'm a school teacher. I'm in a community. I'm in a community where you know it's safe, right? I don't, yeah. I don't have to. I'm not looking over my shoulder every second, right? But I know some people who 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 are, and it's their new norm. And I know some right. law enforcement guys that are in in very high level uh, mm -hmm. law enforcement, where the levels of threat is extremely high, and yeah. they just adapt. Again, they it's for a different purpose, yeah. right? Um, but the thing is, you see, like, I think part of the, the whole unity piece for me is to kind of just tell everybody to, Hey, stop the madness. Let's stop pigeonholing each other into silos here. You know, look, man, uh, <laughs> if I cut myself, if you cut yourself, we're all going to bleed. Okay. Come on, man. And it's the same color. Yeah, that's right. You know, and, and let's just try to understand each other, man, and understand our whys and hows. Like, I'm interested in talking to Andy Norman coming up in, in August. Uh, hopefully, um, uh, his defense lab stuff gets often scrutinized, you know, mm -hmm. because of um, choreograph choreographed movements and stuff like this. But, you know, I've been in the game long enough, and I'm sure you have too. You can find use for practically anything if you want it, yep. <laughs> you know. I can um, learn from anybody. Yeah. Everybody's got something to teach. Yep. If if people want to go deeper on what you're doing, they want to follow you, check out your content, let's let's give them all the spots they can go. Uh they can just look up uh Karate Unity, uh Chris Hansen online. Um okay. you, they can find me at Karate Unity at YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Um okay. and also I have a website, um karateunity.ca. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, Chris, man, I really appreciate you being on this. It's been a heck of a lot of fun. I, I oh, know same. we're going to talk again, but I'm going to give the ball back to you to close us up. How do you want to close today's episode? Oh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you, Andy, uh, Andy Rodriguez, for bringing me down. And thank you, sir, for having me, too. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. And uh, guys, uh, I, I just want to just end with this one message. You know, uh, if you dig deep enough and open uh, you know, have enough patience to just look around and train in something for a long time. You'll begin to see that we are more similar than different. And the differences uh, really just lie in context um, and purpose. Yeah. Wasn't that a great episode? I think Chris had fun. I had fun. I bet you had fun watching or listening to it. And I appreciate you being here and spending some time with us. Chris, thanks for coming on the show, man. We'll talk soon. What a blast. Audience, thanks for your support, your continued support, whether you are part of the family Patreon program or support us in some other way, thank you. Those of you who do that, you know who you are. Those of you who don't, uh, maybe ask why. Ask yourself why. Why Why? Why don't you help us out? And I don't, I'm never going to say you have to help us out with money, but your help would be appreciated. Think of the ways you found this show. Maybe help somebody else find the show. If you want to reach out to me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Maybe we can help your martial arts school with consulting. Or maybe you want to bring me in for a seminar. Those those would be fun things to do. Let's do that. You can follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs> <laughs>